Well, open your Bibles this morning to the book of John. We are continuing in our 21-week study of this New Testament narrative. The first four books of your Bible are called the Gospels. The New Testament opens up with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They are designed to tell the story of the life and the ministry of Jesus. From that manger in Bethlehem to the empty tomb in Jerusalem, the gospel writers record for us the works of Jesus, the words of Jesus. And each gospel writer has a particular audience in mind as they, they wrote their gospel and a, a specific purpose. For John, his specific purpose was to lead his readers to belief in Jesus and through belief that the reader might find eternal life. So it is curated material that presents Jesus as the Savior, as the Son of God, as the only one worthy of our faith. We're studying the Gospel of John in a unique fashion. We're not going sequentially or verse by verse, but we're looking at it in three sections of seven. The first section was the I am statements. We've completed that. We're in the middle of the miracles, the seven signs in the book of John. We'll get into seven encounters that Jesus had with people later on in the summer. So we're in that second section, the miracles of Jesus. And we are going to be looking today at the middle point of our series. We have 10 sermons behind us and we have 10 sermons ahead of us. And today, we'll find our miracle in John chapter 6. Our sign for today is the feeding of the 5,000, one of the most familiar stories in all of the Bible. You know the one where Jesus multiplied the loaves and the fishes. This is a story that's transcended the church and religious culture. It's a story that's been woven into the fabric of mainstream society. It wouldn't be uncommon for someone to reference this story in a non-religious situation or conversation. It's become a commonly used metaphor. When you have something that is scarce and a need that is great, and what is scarce uh, accommodates what is great, we say, man, that was like a, a fish and loaves kind of thing. Whether it's a baseball team with a, a weak bullpen, no reference to anything recent. <laughs> Too soon? Too soon? Or whether it's your own home where your teenager brings over more people than they said they were going to. We say, that was kind of a fishes and loaves kind of moment. And so today we're going to study John's account, his perspective. Let me read it to you, John chapter 6. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is, the Sea of Tiberias. And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this not only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, it would take more than a half year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had, uh, had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, knowing they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountainside by himself. John's gospel contains seven sign miracles. Five of those are found only in the gospel of John. And one of the remaining two stands apart as the, being the only miracle that is contained or found in all four Gospels. And guess which one it is. 
You nailed it. It's the feeding of the 5,000. It's the only miracle of Jesus, the only sign that is recorded in all four Gospels. Matthew chapter 14, Mark chapter 6, Luke chapter 9, and our reading today in John chapter 6. Now, as each gospel author shared details about the feeding of the 5,000 events from their perspective, they included items that others left out. And I wanted to share with you a, a few from the synoptic gospels that we need to add these details to John's account to get the full picture of what happened. Here are some other details that we didn't hear in today's story. First is that Jesus had compassion on the crowds and he ministered to them. He didn't just feed them, he taught them, he healed them. We also gleaned the time of day from the synoptic gospels, that it was late in the afternoon and evening was approaching, which also meant dinner time. We also find from the synoptics that the the disciples requested that Jesus send the crowds home so they could find food. Jesus responded to them and said, no, You give them something to eat. Not only were the crowds encouraged to sit down, but Jesus had them sit down in smaller groups, groups of 50 and 100. We also learned from the synoptics that Jesus was the distributor of the food, but he passed it to the disciples who then passed it on to the people. Now, not only do the synoptics contain collectively some of these details, but also each gospel gives us a unique um, item about the story. For instance... In Matthew's gospel, he gives us a more accurate head count. There were 5,000 men. We call it the feeding of the 5,000, but that's actually not the number. There were also women and children present, which elevates the head count. The the gospel of Mark shares with us the, the motivation or the heart of Jesus. He had compassion on them. Why? Because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he taught them. He healed them. He fed them. The Gospel of Luke tells us the location of this miracle. It was near a town called Bethsaida. Now, John's going to give us, as John does, unique material. And there's actually three pieces of unique material about the feeding of the 5,000 contained in his gospel. First is he lets us know about Christ's foreknowledge of the situation. In fact, it bookends the story. Early on in verse 6, Jesus said that he was going to perform this miracle, but it was premeditated. He already knew what he was going to do while the boat was on the water before he ever sat down on that hillside. And then the story closed that he knew what the people were going to do. They were going to try to crown him king. The Gospel of John is the only one that tells us where the food came from. It was a boy who had brought a lunch. He reveals the source of the food. And the Gospel of John records the reaction of the crowd. That when they saw the miracle, when they saw the sign, they began to say, surely this is the prophet. Let's work through the story verse by verse. Let's begin in verse one. It says, sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs that he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. Jesus and his disciples were seeking solitude and privacy. Their ministry tour had worn them out and they needed rest. But what they found on that far shore when they went up on the mountainside were more crowds, more people who had needs, more people who wanted to hear the words of Christ, more people who sought his healing touched. In the midst of their weariness, they found more work. And and not only were they tired, but we know from other gospel accounts that Jesus and the disciples had just experienced a devastating tragedy right before this event. Their friend John the Baptist had been beheaded by Herod Antipas, who ruled over Galilee. John the Baptist was the cousin of Jesus. He was his ministry forerunner. He was the one who prepared the way for Jesus. And this would have been a heavy burden for Jesus and his disciples to carry. Matthew's gospel tells us that right before this, the disciples had gone to pick up the body of John the Baptist, and they were the ones who buried it. So on top of their busy ministry schedule of healing and teaching, they were also grieving. So they were seeking time away to be 
refreshed. And as they sought solitude on that far shore, as they tried to get away up on that hilltop, they just found further busyness. And they encountered perhaps the largest crowd that they had ever faced in ministry. So how would Jesus react in a grieving heart, in a worn out physical human body? Well, Dr. Charles Ryrie said it well, that Jesus was weary in the ministry, but he was not weary of the ministry. Look at verse five. When tired, grieving Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? Philip, Philip, let's have a picnic. He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. He was in a time of need, but he was still able to see the needs of others. The one who was brokenhearted still found room in his heart for the crowds. Jesus, who needed to get away, was able to still put out the welcome mat. And why did he have compassion on them? Because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he taught them. He healed them. And as the day grew long and evening approached, when the people had waited and lingered for hours, it became time for dinner and he offered to feed them. So he asked Philip, where can we buy bread for these people to eat? And Philip would have been the logical choice. Guess where Philip's from? Bethsaida. He was the local source. Now, he didn't ask Philip because he needed information, but to further Philip's education. And note the providential foreknowledge described in verse 6. Jesus knew what he was going to do. He had planned this miracle in eternity past. This most familiar miracle in the Bible was not some spontaneous reaction to an unexpected need. This was an intentional, premeditated act designed to meet both the need in the moment, but to reveal Jesus as the Messiah to the largest crowd he had ever faced. He wanted to show them that he was one sent by God. And this is the exact opposite of what we saw in our first week in the miracle section of our study. Do you remember in John chapter 2 at the wedding at Cana? When Christ's mother asked him to multiply the wine, he said, my time has not come. It was the wrong time. It was maybe the wrong moment to reveal his miraculous power, but that's not what's going on here. No, this is deliberate. And check this out. The, the miracle actually mirrored a miraculous provision of bread from the Old Testament. In fact, two instances. In Exodus chapter 16, uh, God used Moses to give bread to the Israelites as they wandered in the wilderness. In fact, the Lord said to Moses, I'm going to rain down bread from heaven. What happened in the wilderness happened in Bethsaida. He rained down bread. And, and, and Elisha, in, in 2 Kings chapter uh, 4, he fed 100 men with 20 loaves, and I love the prediction that Elisha made. Not only will these loaves feed my men, but we're going to have leftovers. And here on that hillside, it wasn't just similar to what happened in Exodus and 2 Kings by mere coincidence. These miracles echoed what God had done in the past. And to those people, he sent a clear message that Jesus is one sent from God, one like Moses, one like Elisha. This was deliberate, and Jesus had in mind what he was going to do. Back to the passage, we have a question on the table. Philip, where can we buy bread for these people to eat? And Philip did some figuring, and he gave Jesus an estimate. Philip answered him. It would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? Philip gave Jesus a financial estimate. It would take eight months' salary to give each person just a sample portion. And Philip's estimate did not actually answer Jesus' question. 
Jesus asked where to buy bread. Jesus asked about availability. And Philip answered with an acknowledgement of their inability. In Philip's opinion, it didn't matter where to buy bread because they didn't have the cash flow to buy it. It seemed like Jesus' request was impossible. The need was too great, and they were severely under-resourced. Another disciple, Andrew, also did his research. He took up an offering. He set up a GoFundMe for the Lord's cause. And he came up only with a lunch-sized portion of food gleaned from a generous boy. And he also declared it insufficient to feed those present. The budget wasn't enough. Their bank balance was slim. And the crowdsourcing proved deficient. They only got one donation. So there was consensus between Philip and Andrew, that a free picnic to feed the multitudes was not a great idea. And this is the point when the disciples requested for Jesus to close up shop. The other gospel accounts tell us that they were telling him that the day was getting late and they needed to send the crowds away so they could find food. They had little. The need was great. But what they didn't understand was that their inability... And their insufficiency actually set the stage for a miracle. For a manifestation of God's supernatural power and provision. It just reminds me that we can't live life, a life of faith, with a calculator in our hand. Because God's ways are higher than our ways. He knew what he was going to do. And his power is greater than ours. He is not limited. He has no boundary that prohibits him from doing what he wants to do, like a budget or resources. He works out his plans and purposes even in the midst of insurmountable odds. In fact, the tension of this great need with little resources is something we experience in life, isn't it? It sets the stage for him to make his presence known in our lives. Have you ever wondered why God allows struggles in your life, pain in your life, obstacles in your life, adversity in your life? Well, one of the reasons is that these form the backdrop, the context, the stage for God to do his work, to reveal his true identity, his power, his presence to us. Has the Lord ever surprised you with an abundant answer to a desperate need in your life? When Amy and I were young and very poor, eight months into our marriage, we became pregnant with precious Gracie Girl. So being four months pregnant on our first anniversary wasn't exactly our plan. And I had left the business world and took a job as an interim youth pastor, which means we don't think he'll make it. And the pay equaled that. (laughs) Thanks, Robert. (laughs) So we're barely scraping along, living in an apartment, facing prenatal care costs, and all of those things that you need for the nursery. And we literally didn't have a crib to bring sweet Gracie home to. And we were at some prayer meeting function, leader training something for fellowship. And we met this couple who had just moved here from Arizona and they noticed Amy's pregnancy and we started swapping stories and fears and all of that stuff. They had just had their baby girl two years earlier. And we met them and they moved on. Two days later, the guy called me and he said, hey, this sounds odd, but do you guys need a crib? I said, "Uh, yeah. And he said, well, before we moved... My wife, we were going to sell this crib or give this crib. And she said the Lord told her that there was a couple in Arkansas that needed it. And I said, I'm in. (laughs) That's us. That's us. Now, I'll confess something to you. I figured it was going to be pretty sketchy. A, A donated crib. But when he brought this thing over, it was incredible. It was the Taj Mahal of Crips. It was fit for a Kardashian. It had a, a, a canopy over it. It was awesome, clean, perfect. Amy literally was weeping. It was the crib of her dreams. 
And we learn something. That when there's little, we're not without hope. And the Lord told us, I got your back. But what if we didn't face the scarcity? What if there wasn't adversity? What if there wasn't an obstacle in our path? Having little and when the needs are great sets the stage for God to provide. So in the face of insufficiency, Jesus commenced with his plan to feed the multitudes. Look at verse 10. Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves and gave thanks and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. 5,000 men plus women and children. Some conservatively have estimated this to be a crowd of 10,000. Others have gone as high or beyond 15,000. It's a large crowd regardless of the size. And Jesus took what was little, what was offered, and he gave thanks. Note that he thanked the Lord before it ever even happened. He blessed the food before there was food to bless. And then a miracle occurred. The Lord took something little and made it big. He took five loaves and two fish and multiplied them into thousands of loaves and fishes. He took a happy meal and turned it into a catering company. He took a lunchable and turned it into a cafeteria. And everyone ate until they were full and satisfied and in need of a nap. And note that this was not a tasting sample like you would get at Sam's Club on a Saturday morning shopping spree. It was not a snack. They ate as much as they wanted. There were seconds and even thirds. Now think with me. How much bread and fish would it take to feed 15,000 people? Well, what if we just use the boys' portion as the feeding size. Well, that would mean that they would require 75,000 small barley loaves and 30,000 small fish. But it says in the story that they ate as much as they wanted and there were leftovers. So maybe it was 100,000 loaves and 50,000 small fish. And the miracle goes on, really, if you think about it, the distribution of this much food to this many people was a miracle in of itself. It was a supply chain masterpiece. Jesus had them sit down in groups of 50 and 100. Jesus was the distribution center. The disciples were the waiters. And in the process of going to and from Jesus, there was a lesson for the disciples as well. They got firsthand personal experience of the miracle happen as they took empty baskets back and full baskets to the crowd. Jesus was teaching them I wonder how many times it took them before they realized that he is the source of spiritual nourishment and the ministry for the people. Dr. Mark Bailey had a great line in his sermon on John chapter 6. When did they realize that they had to go to him before they could go to them? In ministry, we can only give to the people what we receive from Jesus. We are pipes, not pumps. We are branches not vines. Well, the day ended with satisfaction. Their bellies were full, but their hearts and souls were filled with awe and wonder and belief. And like Elisha, there were leftovers, lots of leftovers. Look at verse 12. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. Jesus is not just enough. He's more than enough. In the face of their inability, in the face of their insufficiency, the Lord took a meager offering from a generous child and multiplied five loaves, two fish into a buffet that produced full bellies and leftovers for 12 families. It's just a reminder that Jesus can take our little offering and do big things. You know, as an act of trust and obedience and worship, the Lord calls for each of us who follow him to give a portion of what he's provided for us back to him. It's called an offering, or you could even call it a tithe. The scriptures call for it to be regular and proportional. 
The Old Testament standard was 10% of the harvest as often as the harvest came in. And then the Lord takes those offerings and he multiplies it and uses it for his cause and his purpose and his glory. When I first started out my adult life, a mentor wisely advised me to start my generosity immediately. He said, if you can't tithe on your first hundred, you won't tithe on your first hundred thousand. You know, there are some people who don't give. They're someday givers. Someday when they have enough or someday when there's a surplus. And what my mentor was trying to tell me is that there'll never be enough and you'll never think that you have too much. And some people presume that our little offerings can't be used to make a big difference. The principle in giving is that we give of what we have and we let the Lord do with it what he wants. And this boy reminded us that he can do big things with little offerings. You know, we don't talk a ton about money at fellowship, but we do have a purpose. We want to be known as a generous church. We want that to be one of our reputations, that we're generous, generous givers, generous funders of kingdom work. And I just want to remind you that we want you on board I want to give you three opportunities to be a generous giver. Number one is give to the Fellowship Rogers General Fund. Did you know that June and July are our two lowest months of the year because people are traveling or, or whatnot? And I just want to remind you to keep us afloat this summer. We're not in trouble, but let's give to the Lord. Secondly, I want to remind you that we're still trying to pay off our Bentonville campus and we have an audacious goal. We want to pay it off by December 2022. Before we even complete our first year of ministry in the new campus, we want to rip up the note. Wouldn't that be awesome? And the goal is in reach. And if you haven't joined the team, we invite you to do so. And then thirdly, last week, we broke ground on the Samaritan Community Center right out here on the east side of our property. Samaritan Community Center is a nonprofit that services the under-resourced people in Northwest Arkansas. We're in the middle of a building campaign, and they are... Um, well above halfway, and they have a matching grant, and I would encourage you to jump on their team, and let's get that thing built and paid for. You can find information on all of these on our website. Look at verse 14. God's taking a little and doing big things, and in typical Gospel of John fashion, John records the reaction of the crowd. They weren't just satisfied physically, but they're spiritual hunger was satisfied as well. It says, after the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. When the people saw the miracle, when they saw the sign, when they witnessed the supernatural power of God, they said, surely this is the prophet who is to come. They were certain. They were confident of Christ's identity, and they recognized Jesus as one who was like Moses. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 18 actually predicted this response. The Lord said to Moses, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their fellow Israelites, one who rains down bread from heaven. And I will put my words in his mouth, and he will tell them everything I commanded him. Jesus is the fulfillment of that promise. The people saw the bread, they saw the power of God, and they realized the true identity of Christ. The last verse reminds us that Jesus was in control of the whole scene the whole time. He not only knew what he was going to do, but he also knew how they were going to react. Look at verse 15. It says, Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountainside by himself. This miracle, this feeding of the 5,000 thrust Jesus into the spotlight. At this point, he went viral. His popularity soared. Think about it. This would have been his most public miracle with his big, biggest audience. And now you have 15,000 witnesses who are spreading the word near and far. And the crowds at this point wanted to proclaim him king. But verse 15 says that Jesus knew their intentions he saw into their hearts, but it wasn't time or God's plan to exalt him. Yes, 
It was Christ's destiny to be crowned King of kings and Lord of lords, but it would not come by the force of the crowds, but by the power of the cross. So what shall we make of all of this? How do we pull all of these things together? Let's try it with this statement. That God is magnified and we are satisfied when his identity is realized. The miracles are signposts pointing to the Savior. They validate, they prove that Jesus is the one sent from heaven. And when the Lord peels back the curtains of heaven and shows us just a glimpse of who he really is, when we see him in his glory, when we stand in awe and wonder at his power, it's then that our hearts are affirmed in belief and that we worship him and find peace and contentment and satisfaction in life. Where our souls are satisfied, where our souls are more than satisfied, is at the feet of Jesus, acknowledging who he truly is. And the people on that hillside that day saw the glory of God. And more than full bellies, they left with full souls. And I hope you do today too. Would you pray with me? Well, Lord, we're all looking for something in life to satisfy our soul, to satisfy the hunger that's in us for something more than this world can give us. And so, Lord, I pray that we would see Jesus today as the all-powerful, all-knowing, eternal, almighty God. And, Lord, we would find rest in him. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.